So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Laura Arditi. I work for ARM in France, and I'm going to present you uh, what we call some formal weapons for microprocessor verification. So, so what uh, what is formal verification? Is it a weapon of mass destruction? for bugs, of course, or is it something different? Uh, if we compare with simulation, simulation uh, consists in running millions or billions of tests, and uh, we never know whether we need more tests or not, whether adding another million of tests is something that we will bring some value or not. So I would say that simulation can be seen as, as really as a weapon of mass destruction because it tries to catch many, many bugs with many, many bombs. Um, on the other hand, formal verification is more like a weapon for guerrilla war. That means that it is very good complement to simulation, uh, meaning that it, formal is usually able to catch uh, very rare bugs which are potentially very severe. Also, formal is used to prove the correctness of a design and to increase the end confidence of what we are delivering to the customers. Uh, there are uh, a lot of formal verification tasks uh, that simulation is not able to tackle completely or correctly. Uh, for example, this is a case for its propagation of, of our clock enable verification, I will detail that later on. And finally, formal verification is an efficient approach to the validation because we have found that with a, a small team and a low usage of the computing resources, we are able to catch a lot of bugs. Um, so I, I'm going to detail uh, what are the different weapons that uh, are based on formal verifications to validate our CPUs. So this starts at the high level with specifications. Uh, then we go uh, into the RTL really with design bring up, which is a technique where designers use formal verification by themselves very early in the design process. Then we have bug hunting, which consists in trying to catch as many bugs as, as we can with formal, not insisting on getting full proofs. And bug analysis is very late after a project has been released, for example, and some bugs has been found by ourselves or by our partners, and we want really to analyze a, a bug and, uh, and check that the fix is correct. So on high-level specifications, uh, what we want is to verify the completeness and the correctness of some architectural specification. Uh, the good thing with ARM is that we have uh, what we call ARM ARM, which stands for ARM, ARM Reference Manual, and which describes uh, not formally but in a in a form that can be transformed into a formal model, it describes what all ARM CPUs are supposed to do. And this includes, for example, how the memory system behaves. This includes uh, uh, the fact that the multiprocessor CPUs must have a cache coherency protocol, and so on. So from this, we can derive formal specifications, and we want to prove properties about this specification. We, we had some success stories with uh, high-level models, which directly come from the high-level specification. And we also try to validate implementations of specifications. That means that we have an RTL view of high-level specification, and we want to check that it is consistent with this spec. Uh, this is really challenging because of the gap in the abstraction levels that we want to compare. 
Uh, usually, it needs a lot of helper properties to get proofs, uh, which still the proofs are difficult to get. But we are able to catch real RTL bugs with uh, this approach. So this is difficult, but uh, this has a very high value. Now, JSON bring up is an aid for designers when they are writing their RTL. And this is especially useful uh, when, for example, a new block is being developed and the simulation test bench is not available already. Or, for example, when we add new features into an existing IP, but uh, we still use the old test bench, which doesn't support these new features. So, for that, uh, formal is very good because the setup is quite easy and uh, and fast to put in place. Then the designer write basic properties just in order to check that the RTL is not completely broken. That means, for example, it is, if it is a, a cache controller, uh, a property may check that it is possible to, to do a line field. Uh, it is possible to store something into the cache, for example. Also, it's very useful when designers have some assumptions in mind, and they use these assumptions when they design, and they want to check the, they are correct. So, for example, they, they may rely on two signals being equivalent, and so they can write a property to check that and immediately ensure this is true. So, design bring up is very good to catch bugs early. It is also good for debugging because uh, Counter examples provided by Formal are easy to debug compared to the simulation failures because most of the time Formal engines are able to deliver the shortest possible counter example. Bug hunting. Uh, this is probably where we spend most of the time and we use most of the computing resources. So here the goal is to find a lot of bugs at the top level and at the block level. We don't put any effort into getting proofs. Um, so that, that means that we use bug hunting oriented engines inside the tool. And we use dedicated techniques also which are good to catch bugs but not really to get exhaustive proofs. Uh, the thing is that we usually have found enough properties to prove. In a, I would say in a recent ARM CPU, we may have 5,000 properties, and we have different configurations. Uh, so we cannot afford to look at each property one by one point to prove it. Really. We want to run a flow on these thousands of properties and several configurations, and get the best results as possible. And by best result, I mean as many bugs as possible. Uh, so for that, we, we had to work really carefully on the automation of the regressions uh, to cope with the memory usage, which is unpredictable and which may grow a lot for formal runs. And we have uh, some cluster-friendly uh, flows. So bug analysis comes uh, very late into a design project and maybe after a CPU has been released in, into the fields. Uh, that means that uh, when a bug has been discovered by, by R or by a partner, uh, we want to be able to reproduce that bug into formal. Sometimes that means that we need to write a new assertion or a few assertions then we ensure that we are able to catch the bug. If we are not, that means that formal cannot be used anymore on this bug analysis. Uh, then we try to understand whether the bug appears only in the configuration we have seen or maybe in other configurations or in other cases. So formal is very good for that because we can relax some of the constraints and look whether the bug still appears. 
And when a, a fixed format bug is provided, we want to check with formal that uh, well, the bug does not appear anymore. Uh, we also use bug analysis to look into some stuff which are not found by simulation. They, they may be found by human review, for example. So now, ready to the formal weapons. Uh, we call formal weapons some applications of formal which are available as what we call apps into the tools or maybe uh, using homemade scripts and flows and so on. Uh, I will detail this. Uh, they have been developed during the CPU projects uh, real CPU projects starting from Cortex A9, which is where we really started to use formal uh, widely, and then on Cortex R7, A12, A17, and the next generation ones. So the first weapon is a superlint, which is also called auto checks. So here uh, we try to clean the RTL basically. We are not finding critical bugs. Uh, but we, we want to avoid some uh, bad situations where the RTL is, is not clean. So that consists in automatically generating assertions to check, for example, arithmetic overflows and out of bound annexing. Uh, we need a, a very good waiver mechanism for that because most of the time, the failures are analyzed by the designers and uh, they say, oh, yes, we have, for example, an overflow, but when the overflow happens, the value is not used. So this is a don't care and we need to waive it. So we see that as a very meticulous lint tool in order to clean everything. Now protocols. Uh, the, all the CPU uh, developed by ARM uh, use standard interfaces which are AXI, ACE, HB, and so on. So we want to use protocol checkers for these interfaces, but not only to verify that the CPU is sending correct transactions, but also to constrain what is coming into the CPU. And this is really important to avoid false negatives. So the protocol checkers that we used come from ETA renders. And it's really important that they are configurable enough. Especially, it is important that we can turn the property into assert or assume, depending on whether we consider the interface as a master or a slave. Also, they must be optimized for formal. Uh, usually, we don't use the same protocol checkers as in simulation. Uh, they must be optimized regarding the internal structure, which must not explode in formal. X-propagation is a very powerful technique that we use within ARM. And basically, we rely only on formal verification to check X-propagation because uh, it is well known that simulation is over-optimistic and at the same time over-pessimistic for Xs. So we, we cannot rely on, on the simulators. Uh, we verify X propagation using unwritten assertions, using the ones which are in the protocol checkers, and also with auto-generated properties uh, which are generated directly from the formal tools. It is very difficult to get exhaustive proofs on these properties, but that's fine because we are only into a bug hunting approach for this. The important thing is to find bugs because simulation is not able to find any expropriation bugs. So embedded assertions, that probably uh, the most known approach for formal verification. It's also called assertion-based ver verification. Um, the good thing is that designers have been used to write assertions for a very long time, even before we used formal, because the same assertions can be used in simulation. 
we have some guidelines in order to teach designers to write good assertions. I will not detail them here. Uh, we look also at the assertion densities, which are, for example, the number of assertions per gate or per uh, line of codes or per flop. We, we cannot give a, a number that, uh, that must be reached here. Uh, but it is very good to compare inside the same project different blocks. If we have block A and B and they have very different assertion densities, then we can say, oh, look to the other block, it's better than you, so you must write more assertions. But again, we want all the assertions to be of good quality. So the number is not the only criteria. We have developed several flows to prove these embedded assertions, uh, ranging from very simple ones that are used for designers. When they add a new assertion or they change something into the RTL, they are able to quickly run a flow to check these assertions. Then we have much more complicated flows, which we use mostly for weekend regressions, where we have to run several thousand of properties in a cluster-friendly way. That means we cannot afford some CPU resources for that. And recently, we added what we call SOC flows, uh, which are similar to what we have in simulation, when really at the end of a project, we run simulation for weeks and weeks. And now we do the same with formal. And uh, with these flows, we were able to catch some bugs, which required three days of formal run on a single property. We have a dedicated flow to verify finite state machines. Uh, so basically, that flow takes as input a textual description of the FSM, as shown here on the top right corner. So this description is automatically translated into a set of cover and assert properties. And these are very useful to find bugs into complicated FSMs. And in the past, we have found bugs into these FSMs that uh, were not catched by simulation and even by standard formal flows. So clock getting or clock in general, I would say. Uh, it's very difficult to verify everything related to clocks in simulation. And uh, there is a good reason for that. Uh, in simulation, we, we have two main approaches. One is usually used at the block level, and it consists in being very stressful on the block. So basically, at each cycle, we send a new transaction, and we, we tend to maximize the number of of events happening at the same time or very closely to each other. So what does that mean for clocks? That means that uh, most of the clocks are always on. And so we cannot catch bugs which are related to putting one clock off, for example. And the second approach is uh, used mostly at the top level. And this is more to check all the features but it's not really stressful on the design. We, we check all the features one by one, but when we check a, a feature, really uh, we focus on that and we don't put stress on other part of the design. So here that means that most of the clocks are off and only a few of them are on. And when, they are, when we are switching clocks on off, Almost nothing happens at the same time. So it, again, it's difficult to catch the bugs. On the other hand, for formal, there's no difference whether uh, we want to be stressful or not. Formal will manage to do that automatically. So we have three verification goals. One is to verify the regional clock gating. And one is to verify the output stability when the clock enable is low and the same thing on the input. An input must be sampled when a clock enable is high. Uh, 
we, we have dedicated properties which are mostly handwritten for the original clock heating, and we have scripts to automatically generate assertions for the two other cases. Uh, we'll see in the next slide also that how we verify um, the, the more local clock locating. So using these techniques, we found many bugs that escaped simulation as I detailed before. So second equivalence checking is a technique that is not new, but uh, that we are just starting to really use in production. Uh, the concept is very simple. We have two descriptions of two different descriptions of the same design, and we want to verify that they are functionally equivalent. We use that to verify that design mutations uh, are well. We have some design mutations into our RTL, and we want to verify that if we remove these mutations, then the design stays the same. Also, we want to verify that uh, enabling or removing a, a feature is equivalent. We verify uh, optimizations in floating point units, and as I said, the mid-level clock getting. That means that uh, we have the same design. One instance is the normal one, and the other one is the same, but here we force all the clocks to be always on. And so we verify that the behavior of the design is the same when clock getting is used or not. Uh, this verification task can only be handled by formal methods. And uh, in order to get exhaustive proofs, uh, we have to use some advanced techniques like introducing some cut points into the design to basically do a divide and conquer approach. Uh, we have a dedicated flow to verify the system registers. It consists in starting from a, an Excel sheet, basically, that we call ART, uh, which describes each register, saying whether it is read only or not, for example, giving its reset value, and so on. And from this, we can generate some RTL checks, which are assertions, that we run into for all. But that is also used to generate abstractions on these registers, and really it saves it saves a lot of time because we have a single source for different CPU projects. Now on coverage, um, coverage has always been something that was missing in two form. Uh, for a very long time, managers. Uh, say, okay, formal is doing something on their own, but I have no visibility on that, and I don't know whether whether it will finish one day or not. I have no clue. Um, so now uh, some coverage related to formal are available. We start first with the uh, reachability analysis on the RTL. That means we want to check whether all branches and statements are reachable. Uh, this is used to report dead code in the RTL. When a statement is proved to be unreachable, that's a dead code. Uh, this is also used to generate waivers for simulation code coverage. If in simulation code coverage one statement is not reached and it is unreachable in formal, then we can say to the simulation team, oh, do not try to reach that statement, you will never be able to do that, so you can waive it. And that helps to fill the latest percentage when doing the simulation coverage. So, um, this analysis is also very good to ensure that the formal environment is not over-constraining. So, if we have some world dead code, so something that should be common is actually not. Uh, this may be an indication that we are over constraining the design. And also we look at some parts of the of the designs which are not 
enough cover by assertions, uh, meaning that, okay, we need to add more assertions to cover this. So overall, uh, we, we use these different coverage metrics in order to approximate the progresses of the formal verification effort. Uh, we are not saying that at the end, we want to reach 100%, nor that when we reach 100%, we are done. No, uh, this would be completely wrong. Instead, we want to monitor the numbers and ensure that they are increasing. And uh, usually, we are not able to reach 100%, but as they are increasing, that's good. Now, uh, we need to use some formal helpers, which are techniques uh, that we use in order to increase the capability of formal verification. Uh, one of them is uh, design mutations. That means that we change the RTL just for validation purposes in order to reach corner cases easily. That, that is, for example, we reduce the depth of a file fold. Uh, the same mutations are used in simulation, uh, but what is, I would say, magic in formal is that we enable or disable the mutations uh, non-deterministically for formal. So formal will be able to catch a bug if a mutation is required, but also if the mutation is not required to catch it. Uh, we do a lot of initial value abstractions in order to basically skip uh, the first cycles which are used only to configure the design and put it into a, a situation where the interesting cases can appear. For example, if we have a cash on, cash off register, we want to abstract its value so that the formal analysis can start right, can start from, from the beginning with the cash being on. We also use abstractions to skip some irre irrelevant logic that we know that formal is not good at like multipliers, dividers, and so on. So um, if we look at the formal efficiency, uh, of course, it's uh, much better to use formal on small designs. Uh, a CPU is not a small design, so we have to cut it into blocks, and uh, we, we apply formal on these blocks independently. Uh, the advantage, of course, is the smaller design, so the lower complexity, but also uh, fewer cycles are needed in order to reach the interesting cases. To do that, uh, there is a work of specifying the internal interfaces using set of properties. This may be very costly, especially when the interfaces are complicated, but this is something we have to do anyway, and even these interface properties are very good to find bugs. Also, they are used in simulation. So there is a high cost, but a much higher benefit designing, de defining these interface assertions. Uh, we leverage the different formal techniques which are available into the tools, like using a large portfolio of engines and selecting different engines depending on the task that we do. For example, for its propagation, we don't use the same engines as for standard properties. We use a parallel race of all the engines and we try to maximize uh, the usage of the cluster. So basically, we don't want uh, all slots to run for nothing. So the conclusions of my talk, uh, if we take uh, the, the designer's feedback, uh, this is usually very good uh, because designers don't have to worry about false alarms or false negatives. This is something that has always been um, a, a drawback of form or formal or 
an argument for people against formal, I would say. But if we look at the statistics, so we look at the number of real bugs formed by different techniques compared to the, num the total number of issues formed by the same techniques, uh, we can see that the garbage ratio, I would say, is 20% for formal and for simulation that's exactly the same number. So formal is not getting more false alarms than simulation. Uh, debugging formal failures is usually uh, easier than simulation failures, as I said, because there are fewer cycles to look at, basically. Now, a problem with formal is with the undetermined properties, which so these properties are not proven, they are not failing either. Um, this is now well accepted because we have explained uh, this behind formal and why we often get these results. And we explain also that we look at the exploration depth and we compare with various design metrics like the pipeline depth, the number of transactions that can be pending at the same time and so on. So usually we can explain and show that the exploration depth is enough. Uh, the feedback from the manager is good because they have integrated formal into the validation sign of criteria. Uh, so at the end or, or at each release of uh, design, there are some sign of criteria and formal is part of them. Uh, it is very important to report uh, the status of formal on a regular basis and not saying, oh, I'm doing formal on my own and I will work for six months and in six months I will get you a result. Uh, that's completely the wrong way. Instead, we need to provide numbers every week saying, oh, we have proven that number of properties, that number are failing, this is the coverage that we have, and we compare that with the previous week, and so on. Uh, now there are some uh, formal weapons that we want to investigate. Uh, IP exact verification, for example, is part of them. For system register validation that I, I have shown, it will be more natural to start from IP exact description rather than from a hot dog Excel spreadsheet. We want to look at security verification, which is a technique to ensure that we don't have any data leakage from a secure world into a non-secure world. And we want to basically to do formal power aware verification, which is doing all the previous formal tasks but with some power domains being switched power off or power on, and etc., and using the UPF or CPF description. Okay, th this, these were the conclusions of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.